Hey, Dr. Malone, uh, so thankful that uh, we were able to sit down with you today and have a conversation about your new book, which isn't out yet. Can you give us a date on when that will be released? So according to Amazon, uh, they start shipping on October 8th. Okay. Yeah. And uh, will it be on, uh, it'll be on Kindle and you have a hard copy? Uh... It, for sure on Kindle. Uh, it's hardback. Uh, you can also get it from Skyhorse Publishing if you're one of those that are uh, philosophically opposed to Amazon. Gotcha. Uh, there are a few. And uh, so you can get it direct from Skyhorse. And I've also recorded the audiobook, and mm -hmm. that should be ready for upload later today. And the title of your book I have right in front of me, it's called Cywar, uh, Enforcing the New World Order. Uh, why this fascinated me when I, over the years I've been following you and oh, I'd okay. say in about the last three years, you start talking about fifth generation warfare, psychological warfare, information warfare, cognitive warfare. And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why, why is this doctor uh, who could be controversial at some points, right? You, you, you know, right? <laughs> at some point. Yeah. From time uh, to time. <laughs> is writing about psychological warfare. My guess it has to do something with what happened to you and your family over the last four or five years. Precisely. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, we all have our defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And mine is intellectualization, which I'm told is not the most adaptive defense mechanism, but it's mine. Right. Uh, and uh, it's kind of built into who I am. And so when I started uh, experiencing things that I'd never experienced in the prior, I don't know, half dozen uh, pandemic or related events that I have been at the forefront of, uh, I, I realized that this was something very different. Right. And, uh, and what I was experiencing was so foreign to my prior experience that I, I was forced to rethink a lot of fundamentals and try to start processing and making sense out of what I was seeing, not just what I was experiencing myself, but what I was also seeing with my peers. Right. And uh, um, that that led me down a series of we you know we overuse term rabbit holes mm -hmm. uh, to try to comprehend. And you may recall that on the Rogan podcast I spoke about mass formation or mass formation psychosis, the Matthias Desmet theory that's right. derived from Hannah Arndt's work in the 20th century about uh, totalitarianism and the origins of totalitarianism and the psychology of totalitarianism. And uh, that, that certainly helped me and many others. I think the reason, one of the reasons why I talked about it so much was that a lot of people found it kind of therapeutic. It really mm -hmm. relieved them of a lot of their internal tension and stress particularly over divisions between them and uh, close family members right. uh, during the COVID crisis. So I've been, I've been kind of tracking issues relating to psychology, uh, totalitarianism, and uh, uh, trying to comprehend, make sense out of what I was seeing and experiencing during the COVID crisis, which was unlike anything I'd experienced in prior outbreaks. Right. And uh, along those lines, uh, reached back to uh, some of the stuff that I'd learned as an undergraduate in political science, uh, such as uh, the um, kind of formative work on group uh, psychology dynamics uh, that's uh, um, referred to as, uh, let me, I'm blanking right mm -hmm. now, uh, the... Um, uh, I can picture the cover right now. Uh, a group think victims, yeah, of yeah. group yeah. victims, a group think, mm -hmm. and and the other the other core thread uh, is is this scientific work, the structure of scientific revolutions, right. and those kind of capture my frame of reference as I've as I've come into this. Uh, so I've been very aware that there was a strong psychological component to this. And then in noodling about, I uh, encountered a, I think it's 2010 text mm -hmm. on fifth generation warfare. And just like when I first encountered Matthias Desmet's work, I, it just had the, this, the ring of truth that this was something fundamental 
uh, that was related directly related to what I was seeing and experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so I started diving into it. And uh, this is before Michael Flynn's books came out. Right. And uh, so I was just basically going off of the early literature in fifth generation warfare. And uh, in all of my European travels, among them, I was asked to give a lecture in Stockholm. And uh, I chose, I just, out of the blue, I decided, okay, uh, let's, let's take a leap and I'm going to talk about fifth generation warfare to this audience of about a thousand people in mm -hmm. Stockholm. And uh, um, by that point, I was, uh, I had worked with Mickey Willis to build a video that related to uh, the um, crowd stalking and bad jacketing mm -hmm. techniques that were being used and applied to me with the uh, language of uh, controlled opposition and, and that kind of logic. And also uh, in, in trying to learn more about fifth generation warfare, I ran into the recruitment videos from the Fort Bragg uh, PSYOPs unit, yeah. uh, and particularly that first one, which is so stunning, uh, where they, they talk about that warfare is changing, mm -hmm. Uh, and they name themselves as the Psy War Soldiers. This is the uh, Ghost in the Machine video yeah. uh, that's so striking. They've come out with another one, but it's not nearly as impactful. Uh, and um, I used those two videos plus what I'd abstracted from the literature, early literature on fifth generation warfare, to give about a 30 or 40 minute lecture, which left the crowd stunned. Right. So I have to ask you this. When you, when you came across the idea or concept of fifth generation warfare, I'm sure that uh, triggered you to look at what is first, second, third, fourth? Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah. So just to, to kind of reiterate that, that first generation warfare would be mm -hmm. uh, prior sticks and stones. <laughs> sticks and stones. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lining up and throwing things at each other. Yeah. And then second generation, if I remember correctly. And by the way, we did a webinar on this. Right. I'd say two months, three months after the uh, the lockdowns. Uh huh. Uh, you know, when all the toilet paper was gone, everything was gone. Uh -huh. uh, we 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 did a webinar on this, and we looked at uh, second generation warfare, which would be. Uh, you know, civil war. Uh, Precisely. Mechanized, mechanized, onset of mechanized warfare extending through uh, World War One, really. Right. And then World War One uh, trench warfare, uh, attrition warfare, and I think that's and, happening. And the key characteristic there that, that I like to emphasize is the leadership structure behind these different generations. So mm. second gen and, you know, first gen is kind of random, relatively leaderless. There may be a leader there, mm. but it's kind of uh, groups attacking other groups right. in an informal way, then second gen absolutely has a clear chain of command and it's often very right. much top down. And then then we move as your your so go ahead and talk about no third so gen. third generation warfare kind of emerges out of uh, World War II. We get Blitzkrieg um, precisely, yeah. and I talk about Rommel yep. as as kind of embodying third gen warfare, where here you have a tank commander who is mm -hmm. allowed to have operational latitude right. and and delegates operational latitude down to his tank units right. and as a consequence just runs roughshod over the allies right we we had norman oler on recently who talked about the methamphetamine methamphetamine used by the german right. well well that yes that accelerated exactly. a lot of this and that's yeah. brand new thinking to what we've learned in, in joint professional military education we didn't know there was a drug connection to this Oh really? That fueled it, yeah. Uh, yeah. And maybe you knew that before, uh, but we we, we talked. Maybe about... I'm just aware of it because it's starting to come out in the literature. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it is. is. Yeah, yeah. It, it's along those lines. It, fascinating. Uh, so I went to school at Northwestern for my MD, mm -hmm. and apparently back in the '60s and '70s, the drug manufacturers would actually give would put meth pills in the mailboxes for the medical students. Really? Yeah. Okay. It was that common? Yeah. Yeah. So we have this few, well, we have another episode on that with Norman talking about what he discovered from his research. Uh, he was recently on the Joe Rogan podcast talking about this with him as well. But that kind of changes uh, how that happened uh, with Blitzkrieg. It was, uh, it was a, how do you keep the, the soldier almost in a state of flow for a longer period of time? How can you keep him awake? How do you keep well him going? Put. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty fascinating. And then, you know, um, we, we talk about John Boyd quite a bit in, the podcast, and that's really why we have the podcast. And John Boyd looked at Blitzkrieg, he looked at all these things, uh, really made sense of third generation warfare, and the Marine Corps picked up on that in their MCDP-1, which is called Warfighting, 
uh, and they, you know, that's, that's maneuver warfare. And then we get into the fourth generation warfare, which should, to me is that shock and awe that we had in 19, what, 90, 1990, 91. Uh, so we get into the first Gulf War, uh, and then we start moving into... Um, yeah, but I, 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 would push back. I would push yeah. back. Fourth gen warfare is even more decentralized, right? Yeah. In yeah. terms of command structure. And, uh, and it's uh, very much been a function of the insurgency efforts, uh, Al-Qaeda, etc. Yeah. I make the point that I don't think that the U.S. military has prevailed in any single fourth gen warfare conflict. So we, we've studied coin counterinsurgency for years and... We've failed at it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even, uh, even in Afghanistan. I wouldn't say we failed at that. We, we, well, I, I would say with the withdrawal, we could pretty much put a, yeah, the, but, put but, a stake in it and call it a failure. But when it comes to the tactics and things like that, we're pretty darn good. Um, but overall, you're right. I don't think we've won a, a fourth gen war. Uh, going Vietnam. Back. Vietnam. Yeah. Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, my dad was uh, an a electrical engineer from Stanford that mm-hmm. went into aviation. And uh, his first job was with Hiller Aircraft. And he was told at the time, this is late 50s, that uh, there was going to be a war in Southeast Asia. And the purpose of the war in large part was to pioneer and pilot rotary wing aircraft uh, yeah. battle plans. I buy that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's always stuck with me because, uh, you know, once, once you grapple with that, you realize that a lot of of the war efforts that we're engaged in as a superpower um, have these overlying ulterior motives. And, okay. you know, now as I, watch, as I watch Ukraine play out and I hear about the piloting of drone warfare and the impl- implementation of artificial intelligence and now the integration of a fully enabled uh, AI on you know onboard AI drone warfare mm-hmm. where humans are out of the loop right in the kill decision uh, that uh, you know when I heard about that I was like oh okay now I get it that's right. what that conflict is about it's about so we we've heard this term uh, out of the Pentagon and and uh, I can't remember if it's Chuck Spinney who who initially brought it up but it's a military industrial congressional complex right so you got to add that congressional in there too. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. And uh, that same business model, because that's what it is, yeah. applies in the military industrial biodefense complex. Yep. And now it applies in the new censorship industrial complex. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we've, it's, it's a very successful business model, um, right. as Eisenhower warned us about. Right. And uh, it just... Uh, it's a gift that keeps on giving if you're a military contractor. Right, right. So now, now here we are, and, and I believe fifth generation warfare has always been there. We, you, one of the quotes. I we, agree. Yeah, okay, yeah. Sun Tzu yep. is full of fifth generation warfare tips and tricks. Absolutely. Except for the difference is the the technology, the the information management technological base Mm -hmm. that now exists compared to what has existed historically. A lot of the core, you know, humans don't change. A lot of the core strategy remains the same. Right. Uh, But uh, the tools and technologies now uh, available to 5G, uh, not cell towers. Right, 5G. um, (laughs) uh, um, uh, is, Is so powerful. I say again and again and again, the objective here is to control everything that you encounter in terms of information, everything mm. that you think, everything that you feel, everything that you believe is actively being manipulated. And when I right. lecture on this, I talk about a surrealistic landscape mm. that once you step into this, you know the famous quote, the only way to win at fifth generation warfare is not to play. Right. As soon as you step into this battlefield and you are stepping into a psi war battlefield, as soon as you engage in social media, whether or not mm-hmm. you acknowledge oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a full on battleground and it's only getting more so right now. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you step into that, you are subject to a huge array of technologies and manipulation. Right. Uh, that uh, makes it so that if if you if you really think it through, and process what's going on here, uh, it's hard not to conclude that it becomes increasingly difficult to separate what is you, 
in what is your soul, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. from what has been um, injected into you, manipulated right. into you. And, uh, and if you're honest about it, you have to recognize that a lot of the things, the biases that you carry, the things that you believe, the things that you feel are a product of the manipulations that you've been subjected to. Right. Right. So fifth generation warfare is a battle for your mind. The mind is the battlefield. Um, one thing we talk about, if machines don't fight wars, people do and they use their minds. It's always coming down to the mind. Uh, John Boyd is famous for saying people, ideas and things in, in that order. People, people, people matter the most. Uh, so here we are with, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Marshall McLuhan's work, The Medium yes. is the Message. Yeah. We just had a, uh, his grandson on the podcast talking about this as well. And that's, you know, there's that connection to that, uh, you know, that iPhone. That iPhone is... Uh, important to me because I don't have to remember my phone, any phone numbers now, right? Um, it's, it's an extension of me now. It's, it's part of me. So that medium is out there. And but you're showing your age by saying that. About be phone numbers? Beca yeah, 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 because yeah. For, for the younger cohorts, uh -huh. it's an extension of their mind. Yeah. It, it, is, it is assumed a lot of the functions that in our age cohort we took for granted in our education the things right. like memorization, right. building this lexicon and library of, of knowledge mm -hmm. that we carry with us, that we use to make associative relationships. When we encounter new information, we link it back to these old things that we have. And these young people, that that's not being built in. It's not right. part of the education. Everything is at a distance. They rely on this interface device yeah. that is just incredibly powerful in terms of a fifth generation warfare tool. So there's a few ideas you brought up uh, in the last few minutes that I want to kind of have a back and forth on. And that's uh, when we talk about the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. It's orientation is the most important aspect of the OODA loop. It's a square point. It's the focal point. Okay. Orientation has basically three components um, uh, or variables, if you will, genetics, culture, and previous experience. Uh, then you get this process that there's new information coming into it that updates that, and then goes through a process of synthesis and analysis. So I, I wanna kind of build a model with you if possible. And you brought up groupthink. Um, we talked about genetics briefly, but can you kind of explain the psychology of, of hu human nature, you know, the human factor? Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of lead you into this. We know that we reconstruct our memories, right? We reconstruct the past. We, and furthermore, we don't directly perceive reality. Right. It's a controlled hallucination, top down, inside out. We learn any more about that, right? Okay. So, so this, this world that we're in right now, our brain isn't in direct contact with anything that's up right. around us, right? It's our senses or sensory organs that are sending that new information to that brain to process. And those senses have been... Uh, honed and refined, talking about genetics, mm -hmm. uh, around what is adaptive for a human being. Yeah. As a consequence, we're filtering the incoming signal. There we go. We're yeah. only detecting a subset of available information. Yeah. And in some people, that's even more restricted than in others. It varies, so I think. It's already built into us that I think it's called a reticular activating system that blocks information, coming, you know, prevents information from coming in. Yeah. What we're learning from neuroscience is that um, uh, we get into this prediction error process, this Bayesian inference or inference process where uh, we predict what's happening next. Uh -huh. So this goes back to your point that uh, we are under attack. The, the people that know this are attacking you, the, the Facebooks, the, the Googles, uh, the, you, you know. Uh, these people know how you're designed. Virtually all social media yeah. is fundamentally weapons. Yeah. Twitter was designed as a weapon. It was deployed in Arab Spring as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Facebook was a weapon from the get-go. Virtually all of social... Google was essentially a CIA project. Right. All of social media is functionally a weapon, and that goes deep. But it's a function to take control of your mind or to, to influence the mind, right? To, to manipulate. It. Mind, or however you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Mind, soul, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> every, okay. the whole package. Yeah. Yeah, so we, there's, uh, there's something that we talk about inattentional blindness, that we only see what we expect to see, right? Uh, what that means is... Or we can only see that which is consistent with our internal model. Right. So we that will internal... reject data yeah. which is inconsistent with our internal model. So, so that's orientation in the OODA loop is orientation determines how we sense, perceive, plan, act, adapt, and learn in this environment. It's, it's, it's 
a generative model. It's a map that, yes. that needs to be updated. Yep. So that's the beauty of what John Boyd gave us there. And I think it's very consistent with uh, how you kind of where where I think we can go with this, uh, your, your topic of Psy War. Um, what else is there? We, we, we're pattern matching beans, right? Yes, right. Right. absolutely. Right. So pattern uh, recognition is, uh, is key. I think pattern recognition is a key component of what w- constitutes what we call intelligence. Yeah, right. So, uh, uh, if, you know, when we take people through training or workshops, we show that they don't read every single letter uh, when they're reading a, uh, Obviously, a passage yeah, on page. Yeah. It, this is a great exercise. Predicting, right? They're, they're yeah. predicting what's in the middle. It's a pattern matching. Uh, so we, we have these, I don't know if you would call them behaviors or, or innate characteristics of being human. It's, it's you know, we, the way we perceive reality, the, you know, we don't see everything that's in front of us, uh, weak signal detection, things like that. The people that know are using that against you, right? That's that and, and the whole repertoire of psychology, yeah. Skinner, hmm. you know, uh, it's, it, the whole kit and caboodle is being weaponized against yeah. us. Yeah. So, so now that's the orientation, um, and that's under attack by the new information that's coming from the outside world. Uh, one thing that we track is control is outside in, bottom up. And what we mean by that is the system drives the behaviors, right? The, 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 the environment we're in drives our behaviors or modifies our behaviors a little bit. And, and maybe, maybe you can help me understand a little bit more about... Um, uh, epigenetics? Are you, are you tracking anything with epigenetics at all? Not r- okay. a- anything related. To okay, this. so that kind of changes how we're designed down the road. So maybe it's connected to your, your research in mRNA. I don't know uh, what that does to the genes, but it, it modifies them in some way, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and yes, so uh, complicated. Okay, okay. But, but beyond this conversation, we can come back to some, that some other time. So this fifth generation warfare. Um, and you also call it psychological warfare. Can, can you talk about the difference between the two or is there? Yeah, 5G, 5th gen warfare is a, uh, there's a structured logic behind that that is, uh, has specifically to do with uh, hybrid warfare, NATO strategy, mm-hmm. battlefield strategy, uh, um, uh, uh, built on uh, tactics, and strategies and and the logic of warfare. Right. Uh, psychological warfare is a term that I've coined. It's really a derivative of something that Alexander Kozimov uh, coined as he was describing in 2017 in an interview. This is a former uh, Russian SVR mm-hmm. and KGB agent. He was just dis- and who is an expert in uh, bioterrorism in particular. That was his core competence. Right. And he described a series of, of roles and strategies that were just, he considered to be fundamental spycraft, which one could observe being deployed by agencies, uh, in other words, intelligence communities across the board from, mm-hmm. from uh, not just the West, but uh, in, you know, kind of universal. And... Uh, um, so he, he described this series of steps that basically involves the weaponization of information, often around infectious disease, in order to uh, elicit some uh, planned outcome. Right. And, he, and he uses that very ambiguously intentionally because the planned outcomes are quite broad. Right. The, the tech can be, uh, the approach, strategy, t- and tactics can be applied to achieve a, a number of different strategic objectives from just pure economic and political disruption of a nation state right. uh, through to uh, really the adjacency to marketing uh, where you're manipulating populations and by extension politicians mm-hmm. to uh, um, perform certain tasks, take certain positions, uh, buy, buy materials. Uh, um, also to advance objectives relating to control, uh, crowd behavior, uh, um, uh, financial, economic objectives, right. uh, not only just involving disruption. Uh, you know, we've seen this. So this interview that blew my mind when I first read it because it was from 2017. Mm-hmm. And Kazimov was reacting to the latest 
then just concluded bird flu uh, 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 deployment, right. let's say, uh, um, a strategic deployment uh, of bird flu uh, in an information uh, bioterrorism context, his terms. Uh, and uh, he went through a series of, of, of tactical steps um, with describing roles and responsibilities that started with injecting a narrative into the body politic, usually through uh, um, less prominent uh, media sources, you know, for instance, uh, Science Magazine or Scientific American op-eds or statements made by influential scientists, etc., in the context of infectious disease. Uh, and then, or it could be influential uh, climate scientists if we're talking right. about uh, the thesis of uh, anthropomorphic climate change. Uh, but but uh, some experts inject a narrative. The narrative begins to build. It gets amplified in corporate media. Yeah. Then you get the kind of wrap-up articles that take stuff that was boiling up from more obscure journals and then uh, capture that, codify it, distribute it in a much larger sense. He talks about this as snowballing. Right. Uh, and then he talks about the roles and responsibilities of the intelligence community in fomenting this process and uh, how this then starts to gain momentum, impact on the population, starts to impact on politics and political decisions, and uh, eventually leads to the... Uh, um, realization of the initial strategic objectives. And then in the last phase, he talks about that it's really important that once one has basically trained the population mm -hmm. on fear of this item, this infectious disease or whatever the fear object is, and almost all of these involve existential fear, the fear of death. Right. right, which is one of the most powerful motivators, one of the most powerful sources of fear for human beings is the fear of death. We all fear death, and it's, right. it's incredibly powerful. It goes straight back into our subconscious yeah. when one deploys this kind of strategy, which I call psychological bioterrorism, because okay. really calling it information bioterrorism is kind of limits it. It's really right. manipulating the mind. Wow. Uh, and so uh, his point is that as one of these operations wraps up, it's really important to keep the topic alive. Mm -hmm. You don't want to close it out. You don't want to say we've defeated AIDS mm -hmm. or we've defeated bird flu mm -hmm. or we've defeated monkeypox mm -hmm. or we have a final solution, whatever. You want to keep it alive in the population so that you can then reactivate it when you need it for another objective. Right. And those objectives can be to change the narrative on you know current media for instance mm -hmm. we've we see this all the time right now over the covid crisis and all of the other ancillary events we see it with the media all the time a case can be made that we're seeing the deployment of these types of strategies and tactics in the context of attempting to shift the uh um the narrative away from uh, key events such as these two assassination attempts. Right. Uh, um, you you can see this being done in real time in the current political campaign. Right. Uh, it, it, so it's it's a much broader concept than just the weaponization of fear of infectious disease for political objectives. But that's big enough. And as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. People who use this strategy of deploying fear of infectious disease against populations should be shunned. Yeah, yeah. They should not be allowed to be part of any responsible national or international dialogue. And yet it is done constantly right. by the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, uh, the United States government, mm -hmm. other foreign governments. It This is a become normalized this strategy yeah. Yeah. and tactics of, of deploying this this process of so it's it's the weaponization of complex adaptive systems thinking or what we'll call it's the weaponization of, a, of the OODA loop and let me try this um, what I understand about complex adaptive systems is you set the conditions and you look for things to merge and you amplify those things that uh, 
favor that, that you, are useful useful to you <laughs> and you dampen those things that are not useful to you but well put right and that's that's exactly what the OODA loop is you know it's kind of built off the complex adaptive systems thinking as well i don't think a lot of people understand this they they can talk about complex adaptive systems they can stand in a workshop and talk about it but they can't see how it's being applied out in the industry or, or out in the world and and that I, that's from my experience by the way i might i i this i concur that these kinds of concepts are easier to assimilate academically yeah uh and much harder to assimilate functionally right. uh and and recognize their practical implications the uh um this the the use of this approach to uh, affect an objective, I think, can be an example that people have kind of overlooked. Coming from the COVID crisis, Mm -hmm. it is seen with the uh, uh, perplexed response that's occurring in the European Union right now and and, uh, the European Council over the uh, impromptu decisions that were made by Ursula von Leiden uh, concerning these massive purchases of uh, genetic vaccines. Okay. Uh, what what goes on here, and this is the interface between this technology and marketing, and I believe that uh, at the front edge of pharmaceutical marketing is an awareness that this kind of technology, fifth gen warfare and the associated psychological warfare um, strategies and tactics, which are absolutely an adjacency to classical marketing. Yeah. You know, propaganda is an adjacency to classical marketing. Right. Uh, it's just a question of is it black propaganda or is it gray propaganda? You know, it's, <laughs> it's that fine line. Um, but I, a working hypothesis is that the pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, facilitated, perhaps with in cooperation with intelligence community, facilitated the weaponization of fear, mm-hmm. certainly throughout the West, if not globally, uh, in a harmonized uh, strategy that I was able to see because I was traveling, the same words, Mm -hmm. the purchasing of influencers, the same strategies and tactics were being used all across the Western world, certainly, in a harmonized, simultaneous fashion. And the consequence was that this uh, fear and kind of numbness was promoted in general populations, this fear of, of death of this agent which was promoted as having 3.4% case fatality rate. In other Mm -hmm. words, 3.4 out of every 100 people that got infected would die. That was the thesis. That turns out to be totally a false narrative, uh, an artifact of modeling. Mm -hmm. And the actual rate is a fraction of a fraction of a percent, particularly in pediatric populations. But this fear was promoted. And then you had a situation where populations were demanding of their politicians a response. Mm-hmm. And so the politicians were faced with a situation, this, uh, this very much relates to complex systems. I think that it's not necessary that the, po- that the politicians were in on the deal, which is what a lot of my peers assert, right. that they were uh, had nefarious intent and they were actively conspiring with pharma. So they had a plan. They didn't sit down in a, that's, in a room that's, and plan Well, that's... Thing. so the. The problem with all this is that Event 201 did happen and there was a plan, okay, okay, circa November of 2019, uh, that involved Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Mm. the CIA, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, et cetera. Okay, so that that happened. Okay, that's a fact. That's that's what happened, right? (laughs) That's, that's, you can look up the video and watch it yourself. But it's possible a lot of things are just emerging from this. I think that there is a significant component of emergent phenomena in Mm. complex systems Mm -hmm. that has gone on here. And I think that some of it was intentionally crafted and and directed, as you say, um, as it became visible, right. that that there was ways, you know, the famous line, "Don't let a good crisis go to waste." Right. Uh, so, um, functionally, what happened was that world leaders found themselves in a position where they were facing 
uh, torches and pitchforks mm -hmm. in the general populace. You know, you have to do something. And in a bit of a blind panic, they made irrational decisions about what to do in terms of the acquisition of these products, the deployment, the forced deployment of these products, because they were believing, quote, the science. Right. We talk in the book about scientism, uh, but they, they were given to believe that uh, they were listening to the experts, mm -hmm. not recognizing that what they were really encountering was rab rampant, I was, almost said rabid, <laughs> uh, group think. Right. Okay, that's, yeah. that's, that yeah. was yeah. dominating this, but they found themselves in a position where they had no tenable option other than mm -hmm. to buy into these pharmaceutical industry products. And they made irrational decisions. They made huge buys that far exceeded the needs of the population. Yeah that they were overseeing. And I think the only way, there's only, this is another one of these problems when you encounter this kind of observation is how do you differentiate between nefarious intent and incompetence? Right. Or, or uh, nefarious intent, incompetence, and this kind of phenomena of being scared and herded mm -hmm. into a series of decisions. Right. And there's no debating that the outcome of the mismanagement of the COVID crisis was the largest upwards transfer of wealth in, in modern history. Right. I mean, that, that's another fact. We put a pin in that one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, was that, there are many that assert, Ernst Wolf is a leader in this, and uh, Ed Dowd, also a former BlackRock investment mm -hmm. fund manager that lives on Maui, he's a friend. Uh, a number of people assert that this was intentionally planned and deployed. And it's hard to argue against that when you encounter uh, things like the Klaus Schwab Thierry book, mm -hmm. The Great Reset, which was first announced as a strategy by the current King of England. It's, it's hard to uh, argue against there having been some scheming and nefarious intent component of this. Yeah. Uh, back to the complex adaptive systems view with the emergent properties. Uh, amplification of, you know, what, what if, I, if I do this, I get this in return. And there's a couple examples that uh, I'll bring up here. Uh, one is, uh, I saw this in the military, and that is, um, uh, you remember all the piracy problems we had many years ago? Yes, okay. Somalia. You, you, yeah, right. Uh -huh. you, and it's coming it, back. Has it changed? <laughs> it's no. coming back with drones. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Why? Because now we can buy something. Right? It's it's a problem because I want to buy more ships, right? Or I want to buy drones. So that's kind of how that emerges, right? Uh, coming back from, I was in Hungary in uh, was it March of 2020, right before the, the lockdowns. I think it was right before lockdowns. Came back, did a webinar uh, with the government on safety and complex adaptive systems. And now there was uh, Unir Baryam, who, who was talking about what's coming with um, uh, uh with the with the flu, the pandemic, right? And I immediately called my dad right afterwards. And I was like, you got to quit your job right now. We're, you're done, right? Because here I am listening to an expert telling me how bad it's going to be, right? Uh -huh. right? And, and then one thing about this is, you know, I come from a culture in, in the in fighter aviation where we question a lot, you know, after, after we make our first action, we're like, okay, get out of chaos for a moment, find some a complex orient thing. orient right <laughs> find out where you are right get get back into a complicated domain start asking questions and uh, uh, what i started to realize is that curiosity is in there, is not in everybody absolutely folks that have deep expertise they have phd's are really smart in a field would not challenge anything in fact tend to would, be highly siloed yeah yeah is there a reason for that you know why why are people you know Extremely educated folks who are experts in the field, again, my experience, they push back on information that comes from another place. You know? So let me address that. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a fundamental uh, concept in this whole space. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, the uh, mass formation of the psychology of totalitarianism. It, this is, it's been observed, Aldous Huxley has an interview mm -hmm. from the early 60s in which he talks at length about the same phenomena. All right. And it it's runs all the way through psychology. 
about 20 to 30% of the general population is easily hypnotized. They're easily manipulated. Yeah. And Huxley argues this is a good thing, that without this, we couldn't govern. Okay. Hmm. You, you, he argues, I'm, I, I'm not of this opinion, but he argues that a, a population would be ungovernable if you didn't have a substantial fraction that would go along with whatever the leaders tell them to do. Right. Then you have 20 to 30% at the other end of the bell curve, perhaps you and I and fighter pilots in general mm -hmm. represent. And these are the folks, you can't hypnotize them for love or money. Right. Uh, they just, it just doesn't happen. There's something innate in terms of the skepticism of their mind, their questioning. They, they aren't suggest, suggestible in the same way. Then there's the 60% that I refer to as the persuadable middle. Okay. That's in between those two that kind of go with whatever the wind, whichever the way the wind blows. Whatever the dominant narrative is of the time, they're likely to buy into that and go mm -hmm. along with that. And Matthias Desmond makes the point in his work on the psychology of totalitarianism that the job of those of us who are the dissidents in the, the bottom, we call it the bottom 20 to 30%, yeah, yeah. the skeptics that aren't... Uh, so readily suggested, if if we want to resist the the growth and expansion of this mass formation process, and the, the people get confused about that term mass formation, mm -hmm. because uh, it's basically a translation from the Dutch, okay? okay, and so it doesn't really make sense in English, except that when he talks about mass, you could think of it as group, okay. Okay. okay, so he's not talking about lead yeah. or physical matter. Okay. He's talking about a group of humans, a population of humans, a mass of humans that becomes hypnotized and enthralled with a dominant narrative and will follow a, what, you know, there's a whole set of preconditions that lead to this kind of dissociative psychological state that people fall into. Um, and he talks about bullshit jobs, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, about uh, the uh, fragmentation of society. There's a series of conditions that lead people to become highly susceptible to this kind of suggestion. And they become disaggregated from their community and their others. This is uh, obviously mm -hmm. what happens with um, a lot of social media tools and particularly with gaming. Um, it's very effective in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so you end up with people that aren't really connected to each other. Right. And yet they have this fundamental need to be connected. Right. And so what happens is they will transfer their social anxiety because they don't have this connectivity that we need as humans to some third party leader that comes in and basically asserts that they have the magic dust, the formula, mm -hmm. you know, Anthony Fauci is, a, is a, an example. Uh, they have the special knowledge that will relieve the anxiety and stress and fear of the population. And when that happens, the individuals will transfer their allegiance onto this individual. Mm -hmm. But what's strange about this in the context of totalitarianism as opposed to uh, a lot of the other authoritarian uh, systems is that in a, in a totalitarian system, they're, they're attached to an individual, but if that individual falls for some reason, they'll readily swap mm. to another one. Yeah. Okay, so you can readily substitute in another leader, but that's, that's kind of what's driving this. And so when you talk about what makes a, this subset uh, I, I don't want to call it us, mm -hmm. but this subset of individuals that are highly resistant to these uh, um, promoted narratives and uh, strategies that can be used to manipulate whole populations, yeah. it's that uh, they have this innate skepticism and wariness yeah. associated with uh, everything around them in their environment, but their peers are, are just very glad to have relief Mm -hmm. from the psychosocial stress that they're experiencing because they're disassociated. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's kind of the underpinning. Yeah. And, and this, this, it's very odd that historically this kind of 20 to 30 and 60 and 20 to 30 at the top end persists through study after study after study. Yeah. It seems to be something, we're talking about epigenetics and genetics, it seems to be something mm -hmm. innate yeah. in human psychology. So this is kind of odd during, uh, you know, six months after the pandemic started or the lockdowns, um, 
people I hadn't talked to in years started connecting with me. Right. And, uh-huh. and you know, I started self-censoring. Uh, yes. A lot of my friends went off, you know, they, they lost their Twitter accounts. They lost their YouTube accounts. They lost business. It cost them money yeah. for asking questions. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's fury. I destroyed my consulting business that I built up over two decades. Yeah. All you're doing is challenging assumptions and asking questions. And I think there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Which is what, as a scientist, <laughs> I was rigorously trained to do is yeah. drilled into my head. And that's what we're trained to do in aviation. We're, we're always looking for a, a, a how do you how do you hedge? How do you get yourself out of a you know? What's your backup plan? Um, how to adapt to change? All these things you have to keep challenging. And plus, we we have something where we blend egos, right? There is no rank in in the cockpit. Uh, that's that's nice. an amazing thing. We we, nice. we learn how to do that. And they study. which by the way is a great way to combat groupthink. Yeah, right, but, right. Because now we can we can um, find those weak signals in a group, uh, find those few who see the world a little bit different. And start asking questions like, "What? What? What? What's this? I didn't see that." Right. Right. Uh, we have the world of debriefing. Uh, we have folks study us and go, "Hey," and I hate to say us, but they, they look at fighter aviation and the commercial aviation as well, and ask questions like, "How did you guys create this thing called psychological safety?" Well, well we don't know. We've been doing it for years, and uh-huh. and then you would see these um, experts in, in complex adaptive systems, the Toyota production system, psychological safety are the same people that were suppressing or actively condoning the uh, uh, people sharing out information. You're like, these are kind of, they're, they're hypocrites, right? In my view, they're, during that time. So um, it was very frustrating to... Oh, can I give an anecdote? I have yeah, to. Yeah, no. Okay, fr- so to that end, uh, um, back to, not to make it all about Matthias Desmond, but mm-hmm. when I went on Rogan and, and uttered these three words, mass formation, psychosis, mm-hmm. the Google searches went exponential. Yeah, Google started manipulating the search results in real time manually. This was captured through screenshots, okay? Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, the press uh, went rabid. Mm-hmm. And uh, among other things, they interviewed a uh, social scientist PhD in the UK who said uh, this mass formation psychosis or mass formation, this is not in the diagnostics and statistical manual. This is not mainstream psychology. This is just quackism, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Well, then it comes out that this guy is actually an expert in nudge theory, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he's been advising the British government. Yeah. So a total conflict yeah. of interest, and he's basically weaponizing these concepts that Matthias called mass formation uh, to provide service to MI6 yeah. and and uh, 10 Downing Street. I mean, that 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 the you, you're right the hypocrisy can be maddening at yeah, times yeah, yeah. I, you know i listened to your uh your mises institute talk uh which uh-huh. is fantastic and, and there's a nice connection back to economics and, and a lot of things you're talking about uh, you brought up something that kind of shocked me it was a jury ticket yeah uh, can, can explain that i want to just why why'd you bring that up um so uh the I think it's the House Judiciary Committee uh, that's involved in the investigations having to do with the weaponization of government, did a deep dive into events up to uh, the COVID crisis uh, in the vaccine deployment, okay? Um, So through the initial phases of the COVID crisis up to the vaccine deployment, and they wouldn't go further. I've spent enough time on the Hill. There is uh, significant hesitancy to ask questions about the vaccines okay. on the Hill, uh, ex- with a couple of exceptions, Ron Johnson in the Senate being an example. Even, even Rand Paul uh, is a little gun-shy okay. on this one. Uh, and, uh, but um, the uh, Judiciary Committee, Subcommittee uh, and Weaponization, as I recall, within the House, did a deep dive into the propaganda and censorship issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that context, uh, they are the ones that revealed the documentation because they had subpoena power of the role of uh, the GARM agreement structure in uh, uh, weaponizing advertising against Twitter to Mm -hmm. harm the economic prospects after Musk purchased it. Gotcha. Okay. 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 Which is what triggered Musk to file a lawsuit against Garm. Up until that point, I don't know he's a Pollyanna, but uh, he apparently wasn't aware that he was being diddled by Garm. But in this context, they revealed uh, 
that the government in their public-private partnerships with these kind of mercenary, third-party, mm -hmm. often academic-based organizations that have been set up, often which had significant components of former intelligence community membership, uh, that uh, there had been this public-private partnership relationship set up, particularly with CISA, the, the branch mm -hmm. of Homeland Security that kind of coordinates all the censorship, propaganda, industrial complex activities under the current administration. Uh, the, you know, the, the weaponization of mis, dis, and malinformation, mm -hmm. the de declaration of that constituting domestic terrorism, and the action items uh, around that. And one of the things this group did was they set up, they used the Jura software yeah. um, to, just like any IT company would, yeah. uh, to track uh, complaints or issues that uh, always crop up with software and mm -hmm. customer support. So they, they employed the Jura ticket technology and system yeah. in order to document uh, information about uh, themes, memes, individuals, etc., and to uh, document how these were being characterized, what their sins were mm -hmm. uh, that should trigger a uh, adverse reaction in terms of censorship or... Yeah. or uh, the psychological warfare of crowd stalking, et cetera, that was deployed. Um, you know, crowd, you may not be aware, but the CDC set up a whole gang stalking, crowd stalking operation mm -hmm. using the foundation for CDC through the public good projects that then funded shots heard around the world, mm -hmm. which solicited physicians and, and scientists to go online and attack people in a coordinated fashion. They would bla put out email blasts saying, attack this person, they posted this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I got hit, I'm, I'm one of the ones among many that got hit by that structure. Mm -hmm. But in this, uh, um, right at the end of what the committee released in terms of documentation, what my name came up. Mm -hmm. uh, and my name specifically was cited in screenshots of Jura tickets yeah. uh, with uh, the sins that uh, I was an anti-vaxxer, people have, you know, the, mm -hmm. the irony here of a vaccine development specialist that spent mm -hmm. his entire career developing vaccines being an anti-vaxxer. Yeah. And my other sin was I was a conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the irony being here is a conservative that formerly was a registered Democrat <laughs> uh, and did not vote for Donald Trump, yeah. uh, but uh, was brought into that world because nobody else would talk to me. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't get the messaging out about what was going on and what, what I was observing and what the risks were associated with this, except through conservative media. And so that's why I ended up going on Bannon mm -hmm. and Glenn Beck mm -hmm. and eventually Alex Jones even mm -hmm. and uh, all these other identified uh, um, individuals that have been uh, uh, categorized. Yeah as illegitimate in some way using this label of conservative. So, so that's how the jury So I bring that up because one component of uh, what John Boyd looked at in the OODA loop was a Toyota production system in Kanban. Uh, in Agile software development, uh, they use right. Jira ticket, they use Jira, they use other platforms that make work visible. It's a, it's a, card, right. it's a signaling card system, right? Yeah. Uh, it's for, so the weaponization- And tracking. Of, yeah, tracking. So it's, a, it's the, the weaponization of the Toyota production system applied towards this. Um, and it's just fascinating that you brought that up during that uh, something else you've just brought up is um, with that, we'll, we'll call it a weaponization right now. Uh, you have a couple things you can do with it. You can look at it and say, I need to update my orientation as a person. Or if I don't like what you're saying, I can act in a way that suppresses that or attacks you. That way I don't have to update anything, right? True. And th that's that's, that's a, another component of uh, uh, of John Boyd's Observe, Orient, Decide, Act loop is you update your orientation to adapt to the world. Or you, if you're functional, if, yeah. Or, yeah or, or, you, or you take an action that allows you, the person who's taking the action, not to update orientation and attack somebody who has different information or new information that you just don't. Uh, so this this gets into the structure of scientific revolutions and paradigm shifts. Right. So I first made this argument in uh, a a British club, the British club that uh, is kind of the hang out for the conservative party. Okay. Uh, I was there to support Andrew Bridgen, who has been an outspoken critic of the UK government uh, COVID policies 
uh, to empty uh, um, uh, Parliament. Uh, but uh, so I flew out uh, and and gave this talk to these guys, most of whom, with the exception of Nigel Farage, mm-hmm. were uh, in deep denial. They were they were in the community of uh, better to deny the data and deny the observation right. than to grapple with the consequences of their own malfeasance, bad judgment, etc. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this is basically what we're talking about is psychological defense mechanisms, some yeah. of the most primitive ones, yeah. right? Denialism is, is one of the most primitive uh, adapt, adaptive responses. What is, what is responses. the law of unintended consequences fall in that um, as a leader? Like if I make a decision and it destroys the world and, or, you know, it kills people, uh, is that, I just walk away from that and go, I'm sorry. But, but we're, the law of unintended consequences. So I make a bad decision or I make a decision that causes something. How does that fit Or that? blowback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is is uh, the one I focus on. So uh, this, this has to do with uh, the um, uh, uh, platonic concept of, uh, let's see if I can get the terms right. It's uh, um, basically that um, a leader uh, has the right to uh, act in ways that might cause harm, Mm -hmm. uh, but acts out of uh, a sense of an endorsement of the noble lie. So that... uh, it's acceptable for a leader to lie or engage in malfeasance if it seems to be aligned with uh, the greater good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, the greater good is always fungible. It's, it's, mm-hmm. a, co- it's a context dependent thing right. and it shifts all the time. And so we're, we're in an environment right now where there's been clear malfeasance and bad judgment mm-hmm. and, and mismanagement but uh, no one is going to be held accountable uh, with, you know, a couple of exceptions on the fringe, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, certainly not Tony Fauci uh, and um, not uh, the leadership group under Donald Trump, right. let alone the leadership group under uh, Joe Biden. Uh um, there, there, there will be no consequences because these people were acting in what they assert to be good faith, right. uh, and to the extent that they promulgated knowingly lies, which they did. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a, a direct agreement between the U.S. intelligence community and the U.K. intelligence community that any information that could lead to vaccine hesitancy would be suppressed, whether it was true or not. Right. Uh, and so that's, we observe this as lies. Uh, those of us that are aware of what the actual data shows, but for the vast majority of population, they're quite glad to just accept this storyline yeah. coming from their anointed leaders. Uh, and, and this, this really, it all does trace back to Plato's Republic, mm. which is fundamentally a totalitarian text. Um, it, it mm. is wrapped around kind of an authoritarian model of uh, leaders, uh, you know, that, that I speak about this in the book. The thesis was that people had different metal. And when they said metal, they're not talking about what we think is M-E-T-T-L-E. Mm-hmm. The word derives from M-E-T-A-L, okay? okay. And, and the thesis was that there are those who have gold functionally in their souls, mm-hmm. those who have silver, those who have lead, wow. okay, and they define our class structure. That was the platonic model. Okay. And so those that had gold as a fundamental component of their being, of their soul or whatever, were mm. the uh, appropriate anointed leaders. And uh, they were allowed to do what they needed to do in order to lead the general population. And that included uh, mismanagement, malfeasance, lying, etc. That was all acceptable and, and rationalized based mm. on this leadership model that in many ways still persists in, in the modern administrative state. Right. I'm curious, so is, is being a good leader or leadership 
a form of fifth generation warfare? A case can be made. People argue that I am an expert fifth gen warfare uh, um, warrior. Okay. Because of the language that I use and the tones that I use uh, subconsciously. Okay. Uh, this, this, the assertion that, that somebody is practicing fifth gen warfare um, on a subject or a population mm -hmm. is almost impossible to refute. Because remember, one of the fundamental precepts of fifth gen warfare is that it is functionally leaderless. You should not be able to identify right. the source of the pressure, I think is a good way to mm -hmm. put it, um, the propaganda, the storyline, the pitch, mm -hmm. the manipulation, that if you're aware of who it is that's deploying that, they've failed in okay. the context of fifth generation warfare strategy. Okay. So, uh, so this leads into this situation where, and it's insidious, you not only are not able to discern what is truth in a fifth gen warfare battlefield. Mm -hmm. You're not even able to discern who is friend and who is foe. Yeah. Anybody can be a blend. Mm -hmm. They can be a uh, um, hybrid. Uh, they can be mm -hmm. acting seemingly as a friend and as an ally, but surreptitiously acting as a foe and supporting whatever the agenda is yeah. of the opposition. This is this you know gives the the um, driver behind the accusation that somebody is controlled opposition, mm -hmm. uh, which is a term that was injected in the '60s by the FBI largely uh, as a way to counter some of the protest movements, particularly the Indian protest movements. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly effective because it plays off of people's paranoia. Hmm. Hmm. So that's one of the things about this whole space is that when you get into it, you can't be sure of anything. Right. And one of the consequences is, remember we talked about the preconditions for uh, mass formation mm -hmm. and the rise of totalitarianism yeah. Yeah. is the disassociation from social relationships. Yeah. But in a fifth gen warfare battlefield, you can never be sure who's your friend and who's your foe. Yeah. And so it intrinsically isolates you. Mm -hmm. It intrinsically fragments the population and sets up the characteristics that lead to a populace that's willing to accept a totalitarian yeah. leader. Yeah. It's, it is the, this, the, the battlefield of fifth gen warfare is insidious. Yeah. So fifth gen warfare is a strategic game of interaction and isolation. You use the word uh, isolation and interaction in this. Um, I like to think of it as a game of flow. It's, it is a um, who controls the information, who has the information. Uh, I hadn't thought about it in that context before where uh, you could be working with somebody that you might identify as a good actor, but they may not be uh, working in your best interest. So it, it, it's kind of like the, the uh, HBO you know, series Game of Thrones. It's a game of flow, right? Good put. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, wow, this has been amazing. Uh, just so your book's coming out in October eighth, I believe. Again, yeah, that's the scheduled um, date. And and since I have all these copies, uh, author copies, that suggests that they're going to hit their mark. All right. Yeah. No, this is great. Um, and uh, who published it again? It's uh... Skyhorse. Okay. So they also published our first book. Uh, that's Tony Lyons. Uh, yeah. And it's uh, um, Simon and Schuster actually do the press. Okay. Uh, but it's not their label. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Skyhorse is a Manhattan-based operation that right. has a number of different labels, but Skyhorse is one of them, and has been willing historically to take on much more controversial topics than any of the okay. mainstream yeah, publishers yeah, will. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I expect it to do well, given the context where we are in this election cycle. Uh, we, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, it's kind of. It's like yeah. it's getting validated in real time. I yeah, can't yeah, believe that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every day we're living it. You know, we get the data from the uh, the Fed uh, every week, or we get manipulated data from the Fed or the government about the jobs. Job right, reports. the jobs reports yeah, was yeah. fascinating. And, but most people don't notice, notice that. They're like, oh, yeah, whatever. It, it doesn't affect yeah. them. Well, it does right. affect you. It really does, right? Well, yeah. and it affects the financial community. It affects yeah. the business community. It affects yeah. the people. So this has been another one of the epiphanies for me mm -hmm. in this space. Yeah is the realization, you know, I, I constantly get this, who's the puppet master's question. Mm -hmm. There's a, about 20 different ways you can phrase it, but it all comes back to the same thing. Who's, who's the guy at the top that's yes. manipulating all this, you know? And there's 
all these standard answers, the Bilderbergs, yeah. the WEF, Klaus yeah. Schwab, yeah. Uh, the Rothschilds, it just goes on, you know, the Bank of International Settlements, so you know, pick your, pick your conspiracy theory. Uh, but um, undeniably, uh, the bond markets and the financial markets control the world. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to see an example of that, Look at the history of Giorgio Maloney, mm -hmm. who, remember, was pitched mm -hmm. as the next Mussolini, mm -hmm. far-right fascist by the American press uh, and, and the French press and most of the uh, press associated with the Trusted News Initiative all promoted that she was uh, far-right, crazy land fascist. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the truth is she's a center-right populist mm -hmm. and a very pragmatic one at that. Her goal is to stay in, in uh, the prime minister position in Italy. Uh, I've been traveling to Italy a yeah, lot lately. Yeah. Uh, um, Which parts, so, by the way? Uh, mostly uh, Rome, uh, 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 Padua, yeah. um, uh, Venice, yeah. uh, that more southern, uh, not the northern. It's yeah, I lived in Naples for several years. So. Yeah, so, uh, but we, this all kind of got catalyzed because we did a rally or, or we actually spoke in the Senate, the Italian Senate in Rome. Nice. Uh, in uh, late 2020, early 2021, and I, and I went to the Vatican. And wow. so that's kind of set that whole, the, and remember the Italians were the ones that really bore the brunt of mm. COVID, yeah, yeah. particularly in Northern Italy yeah. uh, early on. Yeah. In any case, uh, so um, Giorgio Maloney is an example. Uh, she gets elected against all odds. Mm -hmm. And uh, she comes in as a fire-breathing dragon. And within about three weeks, she's a belled cat. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the financial community, the bond market, Brussels, basically gave her the news that if she was going to try to move forward on these various financial reform objectives that she was proposing, she would be out. Yeah. Um, and so as a consequence, ever since then, she's been constrained to talking about social justice issues and, mm. and women's rights and, and family and these kinds of soft things that don't actually have an impact on finance. Another example is Liz Trust in the mm. UK, um, where she started to want to kind of kick over the apple cart in terms of the financial relationships and the bond market. Right. And they pulled the rug right out from mm. under her and put Rishi Sunak in. Mm. Uh, this, this money controls the world right, right. and money is increasingly consolidated in this small number of uh, whatever you want to call it, investment funds, yeah, yeah. passive investment funds. This is like putting lipstick on the pig. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Larry Fink is anything other than passive, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but they, they control the world right. yeah. and people don't get it. Yeah. Uh, and um, when, when you look back you know, it's if you want to make sense out of things like what happened during COVID or any of these psychological bioterror events, mm -hmm. you need to look at the follow the money and look at who wins and who loses. Yeah, and that's how you will know who was really behind this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And again and again and again, it's it's the bond markets, and that's why I talk when I know that you interact with investors a lot mm -hmm. and the business community. When I talk with my political colleagues that are on the right, center right, mm -hmm. uh, that are involved in the Trump <laughs> administration and campaign and, and uh, CPAC, et cetera. There's a number of them that live very close to here, by the way. Mm. It's kind of their bug out, get out of really? town okay. yeah. place uh, for Alexandria. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, what I tell them is, you know, they ask me, what can I do? And I say, you can try to influence the movers and shakers in the bond market mm -hmm. because they are the ones that are making all the decisions. Yeah. And if they come to the conclusion that the strategies being espoused by the UN and Klaus Schwab mm -hmm. are counterproductive, as is happening right now with DEI. Yeah, yeah, Larry yeah, Fink yeah. apparently is jettisoning DEI, yeah, that's okay, happening. as mm -hmm. uh, from being one of the main proponents mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and DEI is absolutely all about stakeholder capitalism, which mm -hmm. is Klaus Schwab, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what this has all been driving towards. And once again, these theories that they've come up with, untested and tried to mm -hmm. implement on the world, have failed. Right. And, and it happens again and again. And it's coming up, by the way, 
with this agenda for the future that's supposed to get voted on at the UN next week as a pact. Okay. Okay. Just like Agenda 2030 yeah, wasn't pushed as a treaty, but it has the force of an international treaty. Right. Okay. This is the 17 different goals and objectives. That was during the Obama administration. Right? Obama signed yeah. it right at the end of okay. his term. Okay. And no Senate oversight because mm-hmm. that is so yesterday. Yeah. It's all done by executive order now. Mm. Okay. And that, that commits us to the force of law in terms of international law. And they're about to do it with this uh, Pact for the Future, which is a attempt to accelerate Agenda 2030. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, we have to have universal global education, universal access to the internet, uh, universal standard of living, minimum uh, wage, uh, or, you know, or, or uh, basic income. We're all equal? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. okay. Us and the people that live in yeah. uh, the Dominican Republic yeah. or the Central African Republic or, or uh, um, you know, whatever name your uh, Latin American or Eastern European uh, nation state yeah. that is uh, socialist or on the fringe, we're all in this together. Yeah. We all have to be equal. And by the way, it's a fundamental human right to live wherever you want, yeah. which is why we have open borders. Okay, So people, people miss all this stuff. Yeah. It's right there mm-hmm. in these documents from the United Nations. And they assert that they have the best plans. It's actually their words. We have the best plans. These plans are untested, just like DEI. This goes back to complex adaptive systems. You can't plan it. Right. You can't be centralized plan. So they're all which is why, the rule. Which yeah. is why I advocate the only <laughs> path forward, yeah. the only viable path forward that I can foresee, and I talk about this at mm-hmm. length in the book, is decentralization, yeah. radical decentralization based on the concept of uh, um, the, the concept that decisions should be made at the lowest common competent authority. And this is a principle of subsidiarity. This is what we coach all the time. It's the same. It's, it's, it's because it's <laughs> fundamentally right. It's, it's, I think it's uh, in nature. It's done that way too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. And, yeah. and uh, this, you know, you can come up with whatever advanced theory you want mm-hmm. uh, about the nature of man and economics and uh, human uh, interactions and, you know, the logic of Malthusianism Mm -hmm. or Neo-Malthusianism, the logic of uh, utilitarianism, uh, the logic of socialism, the logic of Marxism, or now social Marxism, Mm -hmm. no longer economic Marxism. Uh, But uh, all of these are just theories that when tested, they fail again and again. Whereas decentralized um, local problem solving, this gets to my that other key point that I keep trying to make that derives from the structure of scientific revolutions mm-hmm. and the importance of paradigm shifts right, right. is when you impose a top-down structure onto a, a problem set, mm-hmm. you know, speaking objectively, whatever the problem set right. is, but it could be uh, human uh, um, society and politics is a problem right. set. When you impose a top-down structure, what you do is you completely constrain the ability of the system to adapt and evolve. And the consequence of that is that the pressures, and this is what I spoke to Mm -hmm. when I was out in in the UK at this conservative club, I told those guys, look, if you won't acknowledge what's going on here, you're setting yourself up for major social unrest Mm -hmm. because there's no other solution. If you constrain the ability of the population to adapt and evolve, yeah. to evolve yeah. eventually you're going to have it blow up. Yeah. Whereas in the normal situation where you're having these changing conditions, because that's what you focus on is change, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When you're having changing conditions, it, you, you tend to get a situation in which you will adapt a solution set up until you reach some sort of functional boundary. Right. That's a consequence of the technology or other constraints that you're encountering. And as you do that, there becomes a greater and greater gap between the optimal solution, the unmet need, and the functional solution that you're available to access. Okay, So yeah. you're locked and, and it becomes much more egregious when you have a top-down kind of totalitarian structure imposed right. um, because nobody can um, adapt to it. 
Nobody can adapt to the changing conditions. Right. And when you impose psychological warfare and censorship and propaganda, the people that normally would be the innovators mm -hmm. in that environment gets shut down right. as you yourself yeah. have observed. So you're, you're, you're speaking our language here. Control is outside in, bottom up. We know that. Control is outside in, bottom up. Leadership and appreciation is top down. It's, it's leading like a gardener. You, you don't manage that system. You don't micromanage. You can't. Which is second and third generation warfare right. uh, strategy, really right. second gen, right? Right. right. Uh, whereas yeah. fifth gen, it's totally leaderless. Yeah. Um, and fourth is pretty close. So, Decentralized. So speaking of leaders and money, uh, I want to throw a counterfactual at you. Where would we be right now uh, had Elon Musk not bought Twitter in, in context of psychological warfare? Um, so that, what, what does Elon actually represent? And um, I think that uh, that's a fluid question. Okay. I think both e Elon and... Um, at the margin, starting to be uh, Zuckerberg, hmm. are evolving. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Zuckerberg's recent uh, admission of guilt, limited yeah. hangout admission of guilt, uh, about the censorship and, and uh, propaganda stuff that he's de helped deploy through Facebook, uh, suggests that um, he's either recognizing that it's inevitable and he's got to cover his ass yeah. or he's starting to have a little bit of an epiphany. In the case of mm -hmm. Elon, mm -hmm. he initially bought this product and he, 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 he puts on the retrospective scope, what is he says, uh, $40 billion uh, was, wasn't the price to buy Twitter, it was the price to preserve democracy, I think mm -hmm. is one of his mm -hmm. lines, right? Uh, um, uh, in free speech. That's not why he bought Twitter. He bought Twitter to, because of its installed user base. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. why he was so diligent about how many uh, false accounts there were, okay. how many bots there were, because yeah. he couldn't really assess what the true installed user base was of Twitter, mm -hmm. because that's what he was buying. Why was he buying it? it, you, it the tell is in the renaming X. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, he's been ever since PayPal, He's, remember the original name of PayPal oh, was X. Yeah, yeah. He's been trying to develop a, a, I call it one ring rules them all. He's been trying to develop a universal platform that will have Amazon-like capabilities and mm -hmm. PayPal-like capabilities, financial capabilities. It'll become your one-stop go-to. Yeah. Okay? And that was, that was absolutely the business model that he had when he purchased this thing. And then events, I think, took a course and I think he started to get more and more radicalized as he experienced uh, the, the deployment of all these things on him. Remember mm. that as he was making the purchase, uh, suddenly there was a uh, inexplicable uh, downgrading of uh, share value, market cap, for his major assets, yep. Tesla, um, yep. Start shorts in the market. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He 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 started to get hammered. He lost yeah. like a third of his uh, net worth. Mm -hmm. um, now he bounced back yeah. after that, but there was clearly a strategy deployed on him. He has been uh, almost almost as much as Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. He has been subjected to fifth gen warfare technology or psychological warfare, yeah. and I think that it's radicalized him. Okay. Uh, and I think that who he is now when you watch the tweets uh, that are coming out, uh, they're pretty strong wording in mm -hmm. the endorsement of Donald Trump, who mm -hmm. would have thought that was gonna be coming. Yeah. Uh, uh, just the same as who would have expected Nicole Shanahan and right, Bobby right. Kennedy yeah, yeah. to be endorsing Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, um, Tulsi Gabbard, yeah, but the other ones, no. So uh, where would we have been if he had not bought it? I think that where we are now with his purchase is partially a kind of unintended consequence of the weaponization that was deployed against him. Mm -hmm. I think who he is now is not who he was when he bought it. Mm -hmm. And how he sees the world, yeah. it's everything is yeah. racing. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the news cycle, mm -hmm. the compression that's going on. And Twitter X is playing a key role in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you, I was, circumstances just resulted in a situation, I was in the Mediterranean 
when uh, the first assassination attempt happened. And so I was kind of ahead of the domestic U.S. Mm-hmm. Biz- news cycle. Um, and I got on this as soon as it happened, started grabbing stuff off of Twitter and putting it out in my Substack. Right. Uh, the Substacks went nuclear mm-hmm. in terms of their um, viewership and everything else because I just got ahead of, of the, the curve. But mainstream media was like days behind what I was able to put out in the first yeah. 24 hours yeah. because I was just pulling stuff off of Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Where would we have been uh, if he hadn't purchased it? Would we be having this conversation today? Let me ask you that. I don't know. Okay. Uh, would we have the same audience reach? No. Probably no not. No. Uh, but I'm still throttled on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I Somebody broke into the code. Someone posted a link to mm-hmm. the codes that are used to characterize various accounts. And I uh, was able... To, I, got, I had a, a buddy... Um, who was a coder, he actually was the one that uh, pointed out the C++ error in the CrowdStrike yeah, um, fiasco. Yeah. Uh, so he he dove into those codes and pulled out um, the information about my account. I'm listed as a spam account. Right now? Yeah. Okay. And as a consequence, I'm censored. I'm, I'm a shadow banned. Wow. And so for, a, it's been over a year now, mm-hmm. I was flatlined at 1.1 million mm-hmm. followers just and that's after a period of exponential growth yeah flatlined at 1.1 million maybe it was because i just wasn't putting out good content yeah. uh but i get all this feedback well i'm i'm following you but i never see your posts hmm. uh so that that's another we haven't even talked about information hmm. uh the the kind of business model that drives silicon valley yeah. uh um but uh Recently, for some reason, that rheostat has been turned back a little bit. Okay. And uh, I'm starting to grow now. I hit 1.2 million, and then the week after that, I picked up another 10,000 followers. Nice. Uh, so uh, they're not bots, though, right? They're you think they're humans? Oh, I, I, <laughs> I well, how does one know? I don't know. Right? Um, I, I know when they when I'm getting hit by a bot storm. Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. the, gets deployed by the seventy uh, seventh brigade in the UK. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of signs that you can find uh, to figure out who they are. And I've just got one of the problems with the X algorithm is that if you answer somebody in the stream, it automatically goes to the top, so everybody sees it. Mm-hmm. So one of their strategies is to provoke you. So that I mean, we haven't even talked about all the nuances mm-hmm. of, of the battlefield of, yeah. of social media and psychological warfare. So uh, one of the strategies uh, that are used by these bots and trolls is they intentionally provoke you. And there's, there's various versions of the sea lioning is one. We've got a whole glossary in the back of the book that okay. talks about a lot of this stuff. Um, but they intentionally provoke you. And so you, you get to the point for those that haven't like become battle seasoned. Uh, um, eventually you're just like, I'm going to say something, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as soon as you do that, that comment pair, that antagonism post and your response goes to the top of the stack. Hmm. And so then everybody sees it. So then everybody is reading whatever the ugly thing was that so provoked you that you had to respond to yeah. it, okay? Yeah. So that you have no option when you're encountering these bot and troll storms other than to to um, block viewing mm-hmm. on that post and um, block access of that account to your account, there there is no other solution. Okay, okay? and so you just go through and you just you just um, hide and block, hide and block, hide and block, and eventually, you know, I've done this probably thousands of times. Eventually, you get down to the point where um, the, the troll noise and the, and the bot noise mm-hmm. is pretty low. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you get to where you can sense them. They make kind of standardized, nonsensical attack comments. Uh, someone the other day posted, oh, Malone, he just reads off a teleprompter. Well, that's obviously BS. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah. I'll tell, won't tell anybody that there's one right here. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're guiding all our yeah. dialogue yeah. here. Um, so 
so you just have no other choice but to block these people. And they have these characteristics. They're low complexity accounts. Mm -hmm. They generally aren't certified. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have the blue check or the yep. red check, depending on your platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and they say vile things. Yeah. And they're, they're intentionally being provocative. And uh, they're intentionally being disruptive. Yeah. And now we know because of other things that have been disclosed by the government under FOIA and otherwise, mm -hmm. that a lot of these are coordinated. They're coordinated by, yes. among other things, government agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, don't feel sorry when you no. block uh, the trolls and the bots. Uh, just get rid of them. They, they pollute mm -hmm. your space. Okay. And I've heard a lot of people that are kind of seasoned, uh, call them warriors in this space, mm -hmm that independently come to the same conclusions. Yeah. You just have no other option because of the nature of the algorithm. All right. Hey, I want to kind of wrap up some things uh, with you. Uh, I want to throw it in your, in your lap here. Uh, you, any question you want about what we're doing with the OODA loop or anything like that or any connections that uh, you may have uh, questions about uh, or, or anything in general. So we've kind of touched on OODA loop a mm -hmm. little bit, mm -hmm. but it's been fairly superficial. Sure. And as we said in the pre-recording mm -hmm. uh, when we were discussing, I first encountered this in some of the early academic literature that described fifth generation warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, goes back to like 2010, the stuff that mm -hmm. I was accessing. And it talked about the importance of the OODA loop in fifth gen warfare and this kind of psychological mm -hmm. warfare. And I inferred kind of naively, uh, admitting that, that uh, what it seemed to be referring to was that in this fifth gen warfare battle space, this surrealistic terrain that we enter when we start interacting in social media, you have to make decisions on the fly. And in, in the context of a an information space that is highly, highly manipulated, mm -hmm. which is what a modern media and social media is. Everything is manipulated, right. often uh, you know, to a variety of different objectives. Uh, um, so everything is manipulated. Nothing is really true and straight, right. uh, except maybe uh, um, some you know, the Joe Rogan podcast seems to pretty much, that's his brand, right? Is he, yeah, yeah. Is he just calls it like he sees it yeah. and, and lets the chips fall where they may. And, and so he has this huge following. Yeah. But in, in terms of UDA strategy, my sense is that one of the ways that it applies is that you have to trust your intuition. I sometimes I refer to it as your soul. Mm -hmm. um, it's that inner voice uh, that is yours alone right has to be your your guiding star yeah. and and you have in this very fast paced interaction mm -hmm. that is uh, this modern you you talk about waves or flow mm -hmm. of information and and um, narratives that are constantly flowing by you yeah. in a faster and faster rate uh, that the only option you have, because you don't have time to really do the deep dive for right. the most part, is to um, touch base with yourself. Yeah. What feels real in yeah. an environment where you can never tell um, truth, right. where where truth has has fallen victim to this logic of of subjective reality, that yeah. reality is not a tangible thing, it's whatever you feel it to be. And I think the only way you can do that is to be present, to be calm, to, to you know, that, that interoceptive capability that I, that's maybe touch, uh, connected to your soul, uh, that fingertip feel you get, that the, the hair on the back of your neck standing up, those things are telling you something. And, I, and is that what you're getting at? Yeah, that, that, that when, when I read about OODA loop, mm -hmm in the context of fifth gen warfare, I inferred that what was trying to be conveyed was that in, in this battle space, you have no option other than to use all your senses, yeah. try to perceive whatever truth you can, extract it out of that environment, and then make your, your functional decision about how to 
respond to that threat or that information mm -hmm. or those in, inputs to, to do so based on it's to call it intuition is really to oversimplify it. Yeah. It's not outsourcing your thinking. You need to be able to think for yourself. That's, that's the, the a reason we created the podcast is to help people understand how to think rather than what to think. And um, what you did today is, isn't telling people what they need to think. It's here's, here's what's happening. It's an accounting. It's a perspective. Uh, is it right? I don't know. It, it's you right. Know, it, but it, it's, if it's suppressed, that's, that's not what we want. We want the free flow of information. We have a constitution. We have a democracy. Uh, we have a republic. Everything you want, to me, is you want information to flow freely. And I, I haven't read your book yet, uh, and thank you for the copy, but misinformation and disinformation and malinformation, malinformation. They're, they're all, words mean things. So can you just uh, uh, kind of explain what each one means? So uh, um, I used to lecture in a, in a very uh, confident way about mm -hmm. the meaning of these words. Mm -hmm. And then I started, for the book, I had to do some due diligence on the history of these words and their utilization in early UK dialogue. Okay. Uh, a lot of this stuff and the logic and the language come out of discussions with UK Ministry of Defense uh, and uh, intelligence community in the UK and the academics behind that that, that are helping drive it. Okay. And, uh, and we cite some examples in the book that, you know, are online references. You can go and, and download the testimony given to the parliament, for example, right. from experts in this field. Uh, so, so the definitions have gotten a little bit more fuzzy, but I still fall back on the definitions that were used by the Department of Homeland Security and Mayorkas, Secretary mm -hmm. Mayorkas, in his determination that mis, dis, and malinformation constituted domestic terrorism. So uh, based on those definitions, mm -hmm. uh, which are somewhat oversimplified compared to where the whole field is yeah. of, of research in this, uh, but mis misinformation is, it, it's easiest to define it in the context of the COVID crisis. Misinformation was any information which differed from the official narrative of that point in time coming from your national health service. So mm -hmm. Canada may say something different, New Zealand may say something different, but what matters is, for instance, in our case, the CDC and the NIH. Right. Okay, so uh, our public health service gave us certain information, and also the president did, uh, about Omicron or the effectiveness mm -hmm. of vaccines or their adverse events, etc. And any information that was being shared which differed from that official narrative coming from your uh, public yes. health uh, administration or the World Health Organization. Right. And often those two were uh, not aligned. Yeah. Okay, so it becomes immediately ambiguous, was defined as misinformation. Disinformation was information which was different from the approved narrative, but was being shared for a political objective. Okay, so... Um, uh, if I said, if I was saying that uh, the vaccines uh, were neither safe nor effective, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was uh, the fault of Donald Trump mm -hmm. and uh, his uh, leadership committee, uh, and therefore you should support Joe Biden, mm -hmm. um, then that would be. Uh, disinformation because I would be using misinformation to advance a political objective. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so therefore you should vote for Joe Biden, mm -hmm. whatever the thing mm -hmm. is. Okay. It could be, and I'm just using really stark, clear cut yeah. examples. Yeah. Um, malinformation is the one that I find most fascinating. Malinformation is defined as anything that is true or false. In other words, it can be aligned with known truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, the true narrative as uh, made available by our government. Uh, or it can be false. So it can be true or false. But it causes the hearer, the listener, mm -hmm. to distrust the government. Okay? So if I say the CDC has manipulated VAERS data, 
Okay? okay, that's an objective truth. Okay, you can verify that truth. Yeah. Okay, but um, that will cause you to become distrustful of the CDC. Therefore, you will be sharing malinformation, but information but which causes you to distrust but it's the a government. Fact. It's a, it doesn't matter. That's the point. That's so, what's so fascinating. So if I share out the latest and greatest in employment data, and I know two weeks great from now, going to revise, right? Great, great yeah. example. So that makes me distrust the government when they lie to me? Is yeah. That, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and, and therefore, you're sharing disinformation as the term is defined. Unbelievable. Right. Or malinformation. Malinform I'm sorry, yeah. malinformation. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, these are propaganda terms. Yeah. They, they didn't really exist yeah. prior to uh, um, 2018 mm -hmm. uh, when there was this kind of groundswell of push uh, and remember, uh, a lot of this was kicked off by former President Obama in mm. a address that he gave to the Hoover Institute, mm. where he said that it was going to be necessary to censor in order to preserve democracy. Unbelievable. Okay, so <laughs> you can look it up. Uh, that that was what really kicked a lot of this off, yeah. and and the explosive growth, uh, the Stanford Internet Observatory, mm -hmm. uh, the whole mm. uh, propaganda censorship industrial complex. Uh, the role of academics, and of course, that involves Cambridge back in the UK. Yeah. A lot of this has British roots, uh, um, and uh, uh, that's... so you shouldn't trust any British people. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that's kind of how I feel right now. Uh, no. well, I can I can appreciate that. I have many friends in the UK. I do too. Uh, but I'm never I until oh. we have a change in administration. I'm not going to drop into Heathrow. Yeah. Yeah, but I just saw that they they're going to charge you thirteen dollars to show up there. Uh, I don't know if you saw this recently, but no, I'm I'm stuff. referring to them arresting people for misdismal information in social media posts. Yeah, I mean, after this podcast, I may have to travel out there. You know, <laughs> I'm not, I, I may not come back, so um, I may, you know, I'm serious. So, yeah, uh, no, I, I I'm serious too. I, yeah. I I I travel through Heathrow all the time, okay. and uh, I I won't travel to Brazil anymore. I'm really iffy about going to Canada, uh, and um, I'm. I'm really resigned to I can't I can't travel through Heathrow. Wow. You know, I can go down to Lisbon. Yeah. Uh, and then go up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little wary about uh, Germany with what they've done. Did you know that in Germany it's uh, considered to be a sign of being a far right fascist if you fly the German national flag? Unbelievable. No, I, I used to live in Germany. I spent nine yeah, years. Yeah, no, there. Germany is not the it's, same. It's not, oh, not Germany a, is not the yeah. same as it was. Okay, yeah, yeah. the uh, uh, Alliance for Deutschland, huh? um, AFD party, yeah. which was the leading uh, conservative alternative to the current uh, yeah. leading party. Uh, when I was in the Make Europe Great Again conference in Romania, mm -hmm. speaking, uh, there were people there that were from the AFD. And they would not um, identify themselves as AFD to the press upon interview because they were afraid that they would be arrested upon returning to Germany. Wow. They, they made the party illegal. They made fundraising for the party illegal. And the party was like second in mm -hmm. the elections. Germany has, it's, they, they, can't, they can't perceive the irony Mm -hmm. of what they're doing. Uh, it's, you know, you want to talk about mass formation. Uh, it, it, this is a scary time. Yeah, yeah. The Holocaust deniers, you know, I, I've been to Dachau, I've been to Auschwitz. You know, the preservation of history is important. The context is important, right? And, and here Holocaust the denial is a crime in Germany. Yeah. But where I'm going with this is the moment we start erasing our history, like, like if, you know, here in America, we start erasing history and we, we're taking away context. And with that, we lose the ability to learn. And, and that's happening here in the U.S. right now. Did you know that the Wayback Machine is being edited? Yes. Uh, we have a relationship with them. Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so here's a fun one. Uh, when uh, some would assert, um, uh, that I think it was Maureen Dowd that wrote in uh, New York Times, that there was a coup, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, Harris was installed, and Biden was removed from power. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking about the original assassination of Kennedy. I'm talking about the most recent one. Mm 
Uh, and you recall that there was a narrative that was being promoted very actively based on truth mm -hmm. that Harris had been uh, identified publicly as the borders are. Yep. Okay. Yep. Were you aware that corporate media across the board has gone back and revised those articles That's a to, to take dangerous. that yeah. out? Yeah. yeah. So Bannon first said this to me three years ago yeah. as we were building the book, uh, Lies My Government Told Me and The Better Future Coming. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, books are the only thing that are going to survive. It's the Plus only digital, source right? of information yeah. that will be preserved in yeah. this in this environment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, preservation of information is critical. Let me, so this is important. When we talk about understanding the past, if you misremember the past, you cannot improve the future. We want this is fundamentally Orwellian. Yeah, we we <laughs> want we want people perspectives to understand what happened, right? To look back and because look, you know early on early on in this conversation we said. Reality is, is, is constructed inside, those, right? The, those that forget history are doomed to repeat it. Right. So the art and science of debriefing says we need to look back from multiple perspectives. Bless and, your heart. And take an accounting <laughs> uh -huh. of what happened. An, yep. account, an accountability is the ability to recount what happened. You look back and you look at facts, right? Um, if these organizations are removing those that history, right, uh, but you and I remember something different, we're not wrong. <laughs> no, we're mad. Yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're, we, we, by the very act, I mean, this is so deeply Orwellian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the mere fact that we are retaining that information and uh, if we try to scrub it, we experience cognitive dissonance yeah. makes us a threat. And I, that threat will have to be neutralized. I do remember, uh, and this is an accounting of me, or, or uh, by me, the CDC changed the definition of, of a vaccine. Yeah. Right? As did the WHO. But you bring that up to folks, and they're like, they'll look at it up like, no, they didn't. I'm like, yeah, they did, you know? Here's the document. Yeah. yeah. No, it, no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's the, so the, frustrating. The, it's like, yeah. it's, it's an accounting. My view was this, and by the way, history supports that view, it's irrelevant. It's so frustrating. It's so, so frustrating. So yeah. this, this shows the power of this technology. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, the power of the logic. So another section of the book talks about these, this new caste system. Mm -hmm. There's various, we're, we're clearly in transition and the old ideas of upper, middle, and lower class are obsolete. Yeah. Uh, and the proletariat and the petit bourgeois and all this is, is no longer really useful in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So one of the new constructs is the physicals, virtuals, the overlords, and I added the machines because of transhumanism, right? That, okay. that we haven't even talked about the future yeah. um, and the future of, of robotics interfacing with AI. Mm -hmm. uh, but so in this construct, the physicals are folks that actually do stuff with their hands. They're actually productive. They mm -hmm. might, you know, at one end they're digging ditches. Mm -hmm. At the other end, they're physicians. I mean, people that are actually physically mm -hmm. doing stuff, the HVAC guy, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Those are the physicals. The virtuals live in the world of finance, uh, coding, mm -hmm. uh, all of these industries that we have decided post Clinton is going to be the backbone of America. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to actually produce stuff anymore. We don't need to do stuff anymore. We can let the immigrants do that, right? Um, and uh, this has become the world that the millennials and a lot of the young mm -hmm. are now moving into. And they've all graduated to that from the world of Dungeons and Dragons and gaming and VR. And they live in a world in which reality is entirely subjective. It's no surprise that these issues of gender identity, fluid gender yeah. identity, et cetera, arise from these populations because in their, to their frame of reference, reality is entirely subjective. It's yep. whatever you feel it to yep. be. Yep. Okay. And so there is no objective reality. And so why shouldn't we erase the past? Mm -hmm. Why is the past even relevant? 
the truth is what you feel it to be. It's not some objective thing. And the likes of you and I, because of our generational mm -hmm. bias and probably because of our ethnic bias mm -hmm. or God only knows what else mm -hmm. in the world of wokeism that we share um, in our privileged male <laughs> status, yeah. uh, we, we have the arrogance to believe that there is an objective truth. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem where this all breaks down is particularly in economics yeah. and your clientele. You know, the businessmen, uh, if, they, if they bought into DEI and ESG, they've now learned a really hard lesson. Well, we've okay. seen that, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even the military, uh, you know. Uh, oh, the military yeah. is gone bonkers. Yeah. So I, I'll be clear, I, I, I'm a, you know, I was a DE hire in 1996, if you want to call it that in today's terms. Uh, I had the minimum requirements to get in the Navy. Uh, I did well. Uh, 27, 26 years later, going through the pandemic, uh, I'm in the Pentagon, wearing a mask, looking at other 05s and 06s, like, why are we wearing a mask, you know, six feet apart from each other? And then at the end of the day, we go across the street and we all have dinner without masks mm -hmm. and all that. You know, I'm like, this is crazy. Right? Uh -huh. I mean, we knew that before all this. Um, we went through extremism training, right? Which basically said, if you have any going back to your misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, if you look at the world any different than what you're told, you're, that's a, you're an extremist, right? I'm like, you just told me I can't be a maverick. Everything the military taught me, the Navy taught me. I'm Purdue is a fighter pilot. Yeah, you're like, you're telling a me Navy I, fighter pilot. I can't challenge assumptions now? <laughs> are you serious? And then the system drives behaviors. Basically, the people that are getting promoted are, uh, they understand the system quite well. They're not, they're, and I'll use a, there's a term we use, to be or to do, right? They're, they're part of the system. They're being something, right? Rather than doing something. Uh, you you are a doer. You're doing something. You're not part of the system, uh -huh. right? And that's a, and I think that's what we need more of is people to do something, not... I'm kind of with you, yeah. but I'm biased. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah I am too. I, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, well, anyway, hey, I, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, so glad we got the opportunity to connect with you before you go on your world tour, maybe. I don't know what's, what's coming up next. Oh, it's next just, uh, this is uh, go down to AAPS. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, I think that's in Austin. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, we leave Thursday night and then uh, immediately get on a plane to go to Japan for a rally uh, for the International Crisis Summit. I think this is number seven that we've held. So we've been all over the world on that. Okay. And then fly back from that and... Uh, um, uh, the next day, so we land in Dulles and just take the car up to D.C. to an undisclosed location. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then we go to this, uh, what is it, Unite the, the West or the Republic or yeah, whatever yeah. rally that's going to be held uh, down in the quad. Uh, so that's, that's that schedule. And then, then we get to be home a little bit. Okay. And the uh, book launch, uh, October 8th, anything planned for that? Uh, uh Nothing specific. I've been uh, doing podcasts now, probing it mm -hmm. for about a month and a half. The first okay. was with Nicole Shanahan out yeah. in Malibu, which yeah. was surprising. Uh, um, meeting her was not what she's I expected. She's pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and she's on a journey of yeah. discovery. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the people often don't recognize her background. She was married to one of the founders of Google. Mm -hmm. uh, um, had a autistic child mm -hmm. that kind of radicalized her and brought her into the children's health defense Bobby Kennedy world mm -hmm. but her she's you know yoga met hubby at Burning Man yeah. Northern California liberal yeah uh, just you know straight on JD high, you know high performing JD specializing in law relating to artificial intelligence that's her thing yeah. okay and she's come all the way from that to, you know, interviewing me, mm -hmm. uh, Russell Brand, yeah. uh, all these people, uh, and and really embarking on this amazing journey of discovery and awakening, yeah. uh, and uh, trying to build a podcast uh, that isn't, you know, she's kind of trying to become uh, Joe Rogan for younger women. Yeah. Uh, um, and Love uh, it. I wish her luck. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think she's amazing. What's amazing about these podcasts is it's, it's a network. It's um, this medium is allowing us to have these conversations and 
you know, the, the friends and that have other podcasts that have other conversations, we all, we all connect. Right. Yeah. And, uh, uh not all, not all the it's population. It's a community. It is a community. It's exactly what I've yeah. been talking yeah. about. Yeah. We need to build community. It's a network. It's a network that's growing and, and getting, uh, the real message out there and things you can't do with the mainstream media. I argue in the book that the most disruptive communication technology in ages is the citizen journalist. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a knuckle dragger, you know, I'm just like, Hey, let's have a conversation about something. And, and it's, it's so much fun. And, and <laughs> it's the knuckle draggers. We were, t- we missed an opportunity earlier on. We were talking about why intellectuals and highly educated are so easily, mm-hmm. Uh, manipulated and I I'm convinced that a lot of it has to do with the nature of education in in order to become a highly certified or credentialed individual like what I had to go through Mm -hmm. so I went through 12 years of postgraduate education um, after my bachelor's degree and you know on on top of that Uh, and what that teaches you for instance going through medical school what that teaches you is you assimilate the truth as it is provided to you mm-hmm. from an authority figure, you don't question it mm-hmm. and you regurgitate it, okay? Yeah. And your success depends on your ability to assimilate that given truth uh, and incorporate it and act on it. Just mm-hmm. like what you were talking about, your role in military, in mm-hmm. the modern uh, US military, uh, is very much a function of what you're defined to be doing, right. not uh, your ability to reason independently or question. Uh, and so I think that what happens with a lot of folks that have gone through what's really an indoctrination process mm-hmm. is they have learned a skill set that makes them extremely vulnerable to this type of manipulation. Yeah. Where authority figures tell them what they should think and do, and they do it. People, people mm-hmm. are constantly asking, what happened to the medical profession? Well, it's kind of, uh, this is how we've been teaching medical students for a long time, really since the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, and that's by, by intention. Yeah. Uh, and um, that's that. I wrote an essay the other day about what's going on in Germany with Volkswagen. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is major economic turmoil happening in Germany yeah. right now. Yeah. And Volkswagen is looking like it's going to have to shut down some of its manufacturing plants. And the mm-hmm. unions are screaming murder mm-hmm. uh, and saying, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to resist it, etc." The irony is what's happened in Germany is that they kind of believe their own propaganda. They went all in on green energy, mm-hmm. which is the most expensive form of energy. They cut out their nuclear power plants. Yep. They cut out coal. They cut out natural gas because of Nord Stream mm-hmm. uh, in, in Russia, Russia, Russia. Uh, and now they have an industry that's crippled yeah. uh, because, and Volkswagen was already crippled because of Dieselgate. Yep. Okay. Um, we got, and Volkswagen is the largest employer in, in Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got a industry that is on the ropes and the government and the governments throughout the West have said, you have to build electri- electric vehicles, mm-hmm. okay? And China, meanwhile, has lapped up all the lithium all over the world. Yeah. They are dominate battery manufacturing, lithium battery manufacturing, and they've leveraged that. Now they are the largest producer of EVs in the world. Mm-hmm. And just like Donald Trump said in the debate, that there's a plant, he, he, he kind of whiffed it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He said there's an automobile manufacturing plant being built by China down in Mexico. What he forgot to mention was it's being built by the leading EV manufacturer of the world, hmm. okay, and uh, which is Chinese, which is the same one that is now flooding Germany with wow. its own EVs. Okay, okay, which Volkswagen can't compete with, among other reasons, because it's getting Chinese batteries yeah. at a cut rate yeah. because of the just predatory practices of the CCP. Yep. Um, and so the German economy is being decimated in large part because they believe their own propaganda. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, centralized planned or central, <laughs> yeah. not the decentralized approach to the market. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. I think it's a classic example of what we've been talking about right now and it's what is going to propagate throughout the entire system 
as as we're moving, you know, it's as we're we're all singing from the hymnal of one world government. Yeah. Uh, and I just can't see how that goes anywhere good for innovation. Is, isn't it kind of odd? Everybody's talking about diversity, and yet they want to like make one world government. So not only one world government, they want to have a single universal education system. Okay, yeah. that is going to homogenize cultures all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we, we talk the talk of diversity, yep. but what we're doing is implementing a strategy to harmonize globally, culture, mm -hmm. regulation, yeah. everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I assert that what is behind this, going back to the touchstone, it's all about the money, stupid, mm, yeah, right? It's yeah. all about economics. That this is about minimizing friction, economic transaction friction. Mm -hmm. If you're a big transnational, if you're Larry Fink with his portfolio of transnational corporations, the thing that you don't like, just like Pfizer ran into this, the thing you don't like is having to deal with a multiplicity of global, distributed, yeah. independent, regulatory, importation, economic, etc., taxation, mm -hmm. etc. Okay, it's it's chaos, and it results in greatly ex increased expenses, mm -hmm. and and transactional friction. Okay, and you want to minimize friction. This is a fundamental principle right. of business, right? You minimize mm -hmm. friction. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? Let's go to stakeholder capitalism. It's all inclusive, and let's get harmonization across the world in terms of policies, and regulations, and education, and access to the internet. What's not to like? Yeah. Because hey, somebody in an emerging economy is equivalent to somebody coming out of the tradition of German industrial manufacturing. Yeah. You can just take pick somebody out of Central Africa drop them into Germany, and they can start doing the same stuff that mm. a advanced automobile technician working for the German industrial automobile complex can do, right? Because yeah. because it's all going to get standardized and run by AI and robots, so mm -hmm. what's the difference? Yeah. Because we have all of these useless eaters, mm -hmm. the success population, and we're going to have to get rid of them anyhow because we're all going to move to transhumanism and robotics. That's that's where this is all coming from i think yeah. uh and i think that's what's behind this what is a fundamentally anti-human yeah. logic yeah which i think a way to summarize that is instead of updating orientation to the external world they're trying to push their orientation onto the rest of us and the problem with that is the rest of us push back you know yeah. well or not i mean uh, how much well, power do they have we're about to find out yeah yeah I mean, that, that could, that's, I think, what's going to break in the future if we continue on this path. I, I and again, going back to structure of scientific revolutions yeah. and paradigm shifts, yeah. if you don't allow adaptation, and yeah. the fundamental of allowing uh, innovation and adaptation is free speech, and if you're going to suppress that, you're going to suppress ideas, you're going to suppress dissent, you're going to result in a situation that gets more and more and more dysfunctional over time because of all the change that's happening. And eventually, it's going to blow. I think that's a great place to wrap this up. I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.